This is is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review with Gilad Halpern. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate, brought to you by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. I'm your host, Gilad Halpen, and today's interview is being recorded in front of a live audience here at the 2016 Mood Conference in Birmingham, UK. <laughs> My guest today is a scholar of Jewish literature and program director at Eshkolot, uh, the Moscow-based uh, Jewish renewal initiative. Uh, Dr. Simon Parizsky, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello, thanks for inviting me. So let's talk about Jewish renewal in the former Soviet Union, particularly in Russia. When, when it started after the collapse of the Soviet Union, did you have to start from scratch? How much of the Jewish tradition... survived 70 years of a vehemently anti-religious communist regime. Yeah, there is a stereotype that the 70 years of the Soviet rule or was the blank space or was the whole, the void that uh, there was no Jewish continuity and no Jewish uh, culture during the Soviet times. And uh, the common narrative of the Jewish renewal uh, and the organizations who are involved in the Jewish renewal and the FSU is that Uh, of a tabula rasa, that uh, the Jews of the Soviet Union are just tinokot uh, shenishbu, like uh, the captured children who should be taught everything from scratch. And this is a great oversimplification uh, for several reasons. One is that uh, we should not uh, forget that there was a flourishing Yiddish culture in the Soviet times, uh, Yiddish poetry, Yiddish theater, and in the 30s, which was the height of, uh, uh, of the Soviet uh, Stalinist rule, in the 20s and in the 30s, uh, actually the Soviet Union was called the Red Zion. It was uh, the place of uh, pilgrimage of Yiddish writers and uh, artists and uh, avant-garde poets who left Uh, Warsaw and left uh, other cities uh, to go to Moscow because they felt that this is their place of uh, what was the power. attitude of the authorities yeah and uh, but uh, unfortunately uh, it uh, didn 't end well because uh, this red Zion and this uh, Jewish Romans with the revolution and this flourishing of Yiddish culture uh, you know uh, we sometimes forget that Yiddish uh, the only place where Yiddish was uh, the state language uh, was uh, the official state language was the Soviet uh, Union in, the, in Belarusia it, it's, uh, it was the official language oh, not Birobijan or both? Uh, no not Birobijan oh, oh. uh, Belarusia oh. and even on the emblem of the Republic of Belarusia there is a, uh, a writing in Yiddish uh, and uh, it all ended in the 50s uh, with the doctor's plot and the execution of Yiddish poets by mm. Stalin And it, it was the start of uh, persecutions. So, but the traces or this uh, memory of uh, flourishing Yiddish, Soviet Yiddish culture, which was the possibility of a secular, flourishing secular Jewish uh, model of a secular Jewish culture, it remained in the, I would say, cultural DNA of, uh, of the Soviet, the Soviet Jews. Jews. So, yes. so even though the, the culture wasn't really present around them, it was somewhere in the back of their mind that they knew yes. it was part of their existence as Soviet citizens. Yes, and also uh, we should not forget that uh, there was a certain... Jewish, I would say, uh, Jewish uh, sin, Jewish identity, which uh, uh, kept uh, going uh, through the 60s, 70s, and 80s with people like Joseph Brodsky, uh, who writes uh, poems about the Jewish cemetery and his Jewish ancestry. And uh, even the state anti-Semitism was a kind of uh, stimulus uh, for Jews to s- keep feeling Jewish because they were defined 
as Jews but, but, by but, uh, but other than the abstract idea, did they have anything concrete to go to? I yeah, mean, that's, it, because uh, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't available to them, was it? Yeah, that's the problem that by the end of the Soviet rule, by the end of uh, the 80s, uh, the Soviet Jews became what I call uh, hollow Jews. They had a feeling that they are Jewish, but they didn't know Hebrew, didn't know Yiddish, didn't know much about the content of uh, Jewish culture. And so when the Jewish Renaissance started uh, and all the foreign organizations uh, came to the Soviet Union, the Joint and the Jewish Agency and Chabad and all the Jewish organizations, they uh, started suggesting their own ways of being Jewish. And then it, there was a kind of conflict, and still is a conflict, between uh, those, I would say, imported models of Jewish culture and uh, Judaism and uh, their uh, cultural profile of uh, Soviet Jews. You remember that Elie Wiesel called uh, the Soviet Jews the Jews of silence because they were silenced but it turned out that uh, uh, they were Jews of silence also because they had nothing to say uh, at the, the, this time. Mm -hmm. the, the, they had no cultural uh, content that they could make a statement or what, what does it mean to be Jewish for them. So they started trying all kinds of imported models. Would you say that the Soviet Jews that left... Uh, the country after the uh, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, which were, were the majority of uh, uh, Soviet Jews, and those who stayed had a different take on on Judaism. I know it's probably not the reason why some left and one uh, and others stayed, but do you see like uh, uh, patterns here? Yeah, there are two patterns. One pattern is that uh, there was a, a rather limited number of uh, Zionist-oriented. Uh, 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 people, th there was a Zionist underground in the late 80s, and uh, my brother was actually active in one of these uh, cells of Zionist underground, studying Hebrew and preparing and demanding the rights to emigrate to Israel, uh, the so-called refuseniks. But uh, 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 most of them left for Israel, and uh, so the most active and the most ideologically engaged part of the Jewish population left for Israel. And uh, the masses, the, the most of the Jewish population, both uh, those who stayed in the Soviet Union and those who went to the United States or Israel or Europe or Germany, they are, are the same, I would say, uh, they represent the same pattern of a Jew who, is, who thinks that uh, uh, he shouldn't do anything to be a Jew, to be born a Jew is enough to be a Jew. You shouldn't uh, know Hebrew or Yiddish to be a Jew. You, you, you just, it's a bo an inborn quality. Mm. And uh, that's a kind of type of Jewish identity which still exists in, uh, in the United States or Germany. Or and what, and what about Russia? In Russia, uh, things are changing uh, recently because there is a new generation of uh, several decades have passed since the fall of the Soviet Union. So now there is a new generation of younger people who were born after uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. And uh, for them, uh, Jewishness uh, is a if they are become involved in Jewish culture and feel Jewish, it's a matter of choice, not a matter of imposed identity, which is imposed on you by anti-Semitic uh, policy of the government. But it's a choice and it's an opportunity. And they are very curious and uh, that's a whole new generation, a new type of culture. Would you say that they are the majority of the young Jews or is it still a, a minority that you have? I would say that uh, we are now in the process of transition more and more uh, people, young people, become interested and curious and exposed to uh, Jewish culture by, by their choice. But uh, still, there are a lot of those who are unaffiliated or uh, not interested, uh, and especially because the existing Jewish institutions do not speak in their language. And mm -hmm. they have... Uh, I would say, psychological barriers uh, to overcome in order to go to some Jewish event. It's uh, difficult for them. Mm -hmm. You said that there were all sorts of foreign uh, forces trying to impose their view on, uh, on Judaism. How does uh, Eshkolot address that? What do you try to do? How, how do you square mm -hmm. the circle? Yeah, uh, in our analysis of this profile of uh, the new generation, we would say that the post-Soviet Jews, they have... Uh, uh, several uh, principal traits. One is that they, uh, 
they are very intellectual. For them, there is a, a, an expression of na uh, seven ishma. First we do something, then we try to understand what we are doing. Uh, the post-Soviet Jews, uh, they want to understand first and then do. So they are like nishmavena, uh, say, jury. And so it's very important for them to get Judaism through their head, uh, through uh, cognitive uh, experience, before they w do something practical. Uh, and uh, that's why they're very intellectual and they're looking for intellectual content. Uh, on the other uh, hand, uh, the Jews in Russia today, they are the most westernized uh, part of the population, so they identify strongly with the western uh, civilization and, western, and European type of culture. And for them, Jewish culture is worth being involved with uh, only if it can be framed as a high European or high Western culture with philosophy, literature, not just some folkloristic stuff, not, uh, not just uh, have an Aguila and Gefilte fish and dances. But so, so what kind of in intellectual what, uh, content? Philosophy, literature, art. And uh, uh, what we do as a Eshkolot project, we offer high-level academic events, but in, in spaces like uh, libraries, art galleries, uh, nightclubs, uh, uh, in the open environment in Moscow, uh, because uh, the, this generation of young Jews, they don't want to go into the ghetto of the Jewish community, they want to deal with the Jewish ideas uh, and to encounter Jewish ideas in the open environment, mm -hmm. out of the walls of the ghetto. How, how, how difficult it is, you know, being a Jew in Moscow, taking into account the surrounding that is not always very auspicious to... Uh, especially westernized uh, uh, tendencies? That's a complicated story. On the one hand, the Jewish establishment and the chief rabbi of Russia and the Chabad establishment are very close to uh, the government and to Putin. You always see Putin together with the chief rabbi and uh, Chabad is uh, always close to the authorities. That's why uh, the, there is no government anti-Semitism now in Russia and the Jews feel rather comfortable in political terms. On the other hand, the Jews are part of the general population which suffer from autocratic rule and from limited, uh, uh, I would say, civic uh, freedoms and uh, the crush of uh, NGOs and uh, all, all the problems of autocratic rule. So the young Jews feel very, I would say, ambivalent towards the Jewish establishment because the Jewish establishment is close to the authorities and they are against uh, these uh, limited freedoms. So there is a kind of split or like a civil war yeah. <laughs> inside the, the, Jew, the Jewish community. And... Uh, I would say, uh, on the other hand, there is a process of normalization of being Jewish because now, uh, in the last decade, uh, we as a project uh, feel very free to do Jewish events in all kinds of places where we wouldn't go even 10 years ago uh, in the state uh, philharmonic halls, in uh, museums, in all kinds of parks and uh, public spaces. Uh, where uh, 10 years ago people told us why you are going to do something Jewish in, in, in the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts uh, they won't let you and, uh, and it will be dangerous and, and now it's a normal thing it, uh, and uh, uh, it's the opposite the uh, libraries and the art galleries are chasing us suggesting why don't you do this Jewish event uh, in our, at our venue so I would say that the, there is a process of normalization. Yeah, very good. All right, uh, uh, Dr. Simon Parizsky, uh, scholar of uh, Jewish literature and program director at Eshkolot, a Moscow-based Jewish renewal initiative. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And also big thanks to Tammy Goldenberg, our sound engineer and to the Van Leer Institute for their generous support. If you like this podcast, there are many more where it came from. 
Just go to www.tlv1.fm slash podcasts and take your pick. Our co-host, Dalia Shandlin, will be back with us shortly. But in the meantime, don't forget to visit our new website, televivreview.org. Like us on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. Goodbye.